line, reach in quickly and grab that first. Pretty sure this is the female bird. Yeah, see, so this is the adult cahal. Very small seabird, but very long wingspan. It's over a meter total wing width when it's all um, brought together. And this is, in fact, the female. Yeah, so the male came in first, fed the chick. The female had fed him the previous night, but obviously she was concerned about the chick. And uh, so she came back to spend the rest of the night and the day with it. And uh, so you can see there very different looking than the long tail. They have a black hook feet. They catch um, fresh squid, uh, shrimp-like crustaceans, and small oily fish. They don't feed anywhere in Bermuda's area. They go to much colder water, well north of the Gulf Stream. We put... Um, um, they got webbed feet as well. What's that? They got webbed, webbed feet. Yes, they have webbed feet, which helps them to swim in the water. It also helps them to dig out these nests naturally. And um, what we found is that an average feeding visit for an adult to feed the chick once, it will fly anywhere from 1,600, the average is about 2,700 to as much as 5,000 miles. To feed the chick once, it'll go from here, straight up south of Nova Scotia, out to the Grand Bank, halfway to the Azores Islands, and then back to Bermuda. So it's not like it's just going out 100 miles like the long tails do. They're optimized to get the much more rich, um, rich waters of the Grand Banks and colder waters and their flying ability. They can fly 300 to 500 miles a day in, wow. in strong wind conditions. That wow. gives them the, the chance, you know, the ability to do that. Long tails can't. These guys could fly circles around long tails. Wow. Now, if I could just ask one of you just to hold it here yeah, around the wing, just hold, yeah, yeah grip around the wing so it can't do that. Oh boy, is he <laughs> fast. <laughs> So this is the chick. Oh my god, look at the chick. Oh my god. And this chick, this is still quite young. It's only about uh what about I think yeah, if you could keep the <laughs> the noise down a little bit. Um it's it's probably I think it was on the second or third of March now, so it's about two weeks old more or less. Uh his fat is a dumpling and um he was fifty two grams on Monday. So three days later after two feeds I'm gonna see just how much he is. So I do. Put him in. He is so fat. He feels like a furry grape almost. So make these holes here. Mm -hmm. Hollow them out. Look. Look. Yeah, let, let me just uh, get this guy out of the way and then I'll answer your question. Oh my god. Remember he I said he was fifty two grams? Yeah. <laughs> You're not gonna believe this. He's gained almost a hundred pounds. a uh, hundred grams. hundred pounds, jeez. Hundred grams. He is now a hundred and yeah, it is. One fifty five. So that's one forty five. Hundred and 153 grams, so you've wow. gained exactly 100 grams. So he's increased in weight by two thirds oh. you know, over what he was. Um, so he is he is a fat, happy little dumpling right now. And uh, although he's kind of small for his age, um, he it was with a fat, full tummy like that, he's going to grow very, very quickly. So and that's great. So 153. That's mind-boggling. That's one of the highest um, weight gains I have seen, and I've been I've been doing this for um, oh god now about uh, so 17 years. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. He, goes, like he goes into the entrance. Or okay. well, she, I should say, this is the mother, the female. So I'm gonna put that down to 153. So the adult weight now. She is normally quite a heavy bird, but she stayed over for a day and fed the chick four times, so he emptied every bit of food out of her. But she's still, she's still actually not in bad shape. Uh, 149. Yeah, 
329 grams. So that's, that's not bad for the female. The males are a little bit, about 20% heavier and larger than the females. And I know her, her band number. We fit them with a permanent band on the leg when they're chicks. And so I know, for example, that this adult was a bird I, I brought over from that island, that little tiny island there, brought over in 2006 as a chick. Um, I raised it for three weeks on fresh squid and anchovies. And um, in this nest, right next to it, in fact, so I know the whole history of this bird, and um, it returned uh, four years later, paired up with a male bird that we'd also moved as a chick, and um, has been nesting uh, since 2009, basically. So, uh, you know, 2010, sorry, that's when they produced their first egg. So, um, it has produced, this is the fourth chick in four years, yeah. four consecutive. So, I'm going to put her back now. The reason that that is the entrance to this nest. She'll go up the tunnel and into the nest chamber there. And the reason why they have to have that long entrance tunnel is because although they live on the open ocean, um, they don't ever see land in their lifetime. The only land they ever see is the nesting grounds during nesting season. Um, they stay generally about 50 to 150 miles offshore off of any of the continents. And we know now from tracking them that they go as far um, afield as within 100 miles of the coast of southwest Ireland and northwest France. Oh, so they actually go 30, 34, 3,800 miles away to Palearctic waters in off of Western Europe. So they have an amazing range from the Bahamas to, to Ireland, basically, and, and up to Iceland and the south tip of Greenland. Um, and we had no idea that they do this, but they have an amazing flying ability. And they, they move at an average rate in high winds of about 50 miles an hour. Most seabirds are flying along at a pretty steady 15 to 25 miles an hour, maybe 30 mile an hour per short burst. But these guys, they're related to albatrosses who fly around the world, you know, around Antarctica just to feed the chicks. So, you know, it's, it's all in the family. They're long distance, high speed, um, ocean my migrants, really. Can you move up that way? Yeah, so we'll go up to the top one. There's several other chicks here.